Well, here's something I've wanted to do for a long time, track by track. That's what we're doing. Selling England by the pound. And our special guest is the guitarist who was on that album, Steve Hackett, Genesis. I'm John Bowden from Rock History Book. I might sound a little overly excited right now because Selling England by the Pound is my favorite album from Genesis. It's a lot of people's favorite album from Genesis. Classic lineup, Phil Collins, Tony Banks, Mike Rutherford, Peter Gabriel, and Steve Hackett. As I tell Steve during this interview, last time we talked, this is our fourth interview, we went through his album Spectral Mornings track by track. And since his new live album that's coming out just around the corner, is Selling England by the Pound, Spectral Mornings Live, I thought, well, let's go through every track. And Steve Hackett is just one of the most agreeable, just an easygoing, incredibly intelligent man to interview. He still has a curious mind. So, Selling England by the Pound, released October 13th, 1973. Here's our track by track with our special guest, Steve Hackett. With Dancing with the Moon at Night, was that you and Peter just coming up with separate ideas and putting them together? Well, I think, you know, th that was a song that, um, it started off with Pete's idea. And Pete had the song at the beginning, the rest of us all contributed to the jigsaw. Yeah. So um, there are moments that are guitar led, there are moments that are keyboard led. It's really a band working at peak, I like to, coming up with material that's surprising you know it's it's a song that changes gear from beginning to end you've got the song you've got the the acapella thing at the front the scottish plain song influence then you've got the elgarian motif if you like something that's kind of anthemic and hymnal uh then you're off what people would describe later as as, as fusion or jazz rock or whatever you want to call it but there's a hint of mozart there's there are all those notes salvos coming at you there's tap there's sweet picking, there's octave jumps in the guitar solo, there's tricky timing, there's, you know, something that you might, you might have, found, uh, have found was more at home in, in Prokofiev or Stravinsky. Yeah. There are all these influences that are in there, big band stuff, and then this really quiet jam at the end, uh, which is extremely restrained, but very atmospheric. I think it's my favorite Genesis song of all time. I know what I like was, was that really a jam between you and, and Phil when you when you started that off? Yeah, it was, uh, I had a riff that the song was built on. Phil and I used to jam on it, so we used to set up a groove. The other guys joined that. It was much longer originally, but we whittled it down, so it was verses and chords, typical uh, pop song format, but with a very quirky English, unobvious lyric. I think it had. there was an aspect of, of the Beatles about it. Fortunately, I think each time I got to steer that album a little bit, I, I got listened to and maybe suggesting that the opening line should be in harmony gave it that stronger thing. But then you've got all that stuff between Pete and Phil, all that percussion stuff at the front. I suggested the drone doubling as the kind of uh, the um, the lawnmower motor. But you know, it's it's kind of allegorical. It's got it's it's got subtlety considering it was our first hit single. It's got a most unlikely lyric. I like the fact that when I read that, like every riff you brought in, basically they were used on that album, right? Oh uh, yeah, I didn't have any ideas that that were thrown away so that really made a big difference I, I think that i didn't contribute as many songs to this album uh, but i contributed riffs I, I felt it was easier to impose that than to try and steal the keys to the song writing cabinet and genesis didn't always take kindly to that so you could say that that it's maybe closer to jimmy page's approach where i think his approach to uh, songwriting has, has always been uh, riff driven now, that wouldn't have worked with genesis most of the time because um harmonically i think that, that, that genesis was more more sophisticated but and that's largely down to um down to tony banks of course and all that you know that classical influence but i think that's also what made the band strong yeah. it's a very subtle band at times but then you had the emerging singer the lead singer that was to become phil uh, with 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 more for me so it was lovely to to revisit that live and to give it a slightly more fleshed out arrangement but it's beautiful to be able to do that song again and first the fifth was another one when you brought in uh, you know riffing ideas right with that yeah i think that you know i'm i'm always complimenting tony banks with that song whereas a lot of fans tend to say well yeah but you know it's your it, it's your moment because of what the guitar does because the guitar gets to take it for three minutes straight halfway through the song and um, all I can say is my interpretation 
of his melody. So sometimes you have to be content with being an arranger or a humble plank spanker. You know, that's that's mm. what you have to do. Um, but it, it, it was a great tune. I remember Pete said to me when Tony came up with the uh, the verse, he said, look, I, I do believe that Tony is very close to writing a blues here for the first time. So I think, I think he saw a slightly sort of gospel feel in it. Something, there was something that was not merely European. What was the reaction? I know Phil had sang before and harmonized, of course, but more fool me. Like that's basically is that that's um, Mike and basically Mike and, and Phil, right? Mike and Phil, Phil and Mike doing it. It's been very lovely. I never played on it on the record, but it's lovely to be able to do it live now with the addition of of you know harpsichord and, and mm-hmm. uh, extra extra keyboards, some strings. I use twelve string on it, and I play something like the, the part that Mike played, but in a way, um, I try and play guitar a little bit like a keyboard player at times. So I'm sounding more like a harpsichord playing that, and then uh, Roger King playing keyboards with us now uh, tends to play more like a guitarist. So we blur that, and it always was part of the appeal and the, and the soundscaping of early Genesis, this combination of things where you couldn't quite tell, it was it guitar, was it keyboard? And, you know, the marriage of those two ideas and those sound sources are what characterized the early band a lot. It really goes into, the, the I think, the spirit of the band. of Like, when you redo them, for me, it adds, like, an element of what would sound like if it was made today. And it's still yeah, growing. That's, that's really very much it. You've hit the nail on the head. I like to think that those songs were constructed organically with people suggesting things and if it was a piece of a sculpture then that still gets polished through what i do with it what the band uh, bring to it for instance when rob does stuff sometimes the diehards feel that all the flute parts should be played on flute whereas i think well yes but that might be better on soprano sax, mm-hmm. or we may double up. You know what was originally supposed to be a trumpet on analog keyboard. When you double that with, with something windblown, then suddenly it becomes closer to the original uh, inspiration for it. And the, here comes the cavalry moment, for instance, on, on Epping Forest. I feel that by doing that and adding some trills myself, in a way, it's it's coloring it to the degree that it perhaps should have been or could have been originally. You know, the Battle of the Epping Forest that comes in, like, that's basically you trading off with uh, Tony right in the beginning with the march. That That's basically... Yeah, I, I had this thing where I used to do, uh, with my early equipment, I used to have, it was a fuzz box, probably a Marshall Super Fuzz or a Tone Bender. Then I put it through an Optivider, an Optivider, old piece of kit that I used, Jeff Beck used, all sorts of people. Then I also had this sound-on-sound sound aspect with the Echoplex, and of course, like you know, most analog stuff in those days, if you use the long delay, for instance, you, you could get it to fold on itself and it would crack up, start to distort. And the combination of all those things created the marching feet at the beginning of it. And it became a march in 7-8, which is quite rare, at the beginning of the song. And um, of course, yeah, we, we use a mixture of it, of it live. We use real flute now and... Um, and a little bit of, I don't think it's it's Mellotron flute anymore, but um, it's probably an upgrade from that. But um, back in the day, of course, real flute and Mellotron mm-hmm. worked very well for the Genesis at times, worked very well for the Beatles, of course. You came out, uh, you come out of that song, I mean, you come in like a, with a, like very subtle, of course, but at the end of it, I mean, and of course, it's a keyboard heavy song, I know, but it builds yeah. and builds and it changes and changes. You come out of that like a bat out of hell. It's It's great the way you come out of that song. Yeah, the guitar goes nuts right at the end and it does that with a, a tricky truncated time signature. And uh, whenever I play it live, I, I always have to be on my metal to be able to, to do that. But uh, I must admit, I've enjoyed doing that song in front of people these days because we kind of failed it back in the early days because we couldn't make things sound quite right in front of people with the technology we had then. But it wasn't until I was working, funnily enough, very briefly with an Argentinian band called Genetics that I was playing a show with them, I was a guest with them, and they said, oh, should we do Epping Forest? And I said, well, I haven't done that one for a long time, and I'll stand back and let you guys take it. And I thought how strong it sounded from the wings. I thought, I can see why people like this. You know, you've got to have the yeah. live experience of it, where it tears into it, and I'm just colouring the keyboards with an edge of guitar and coming out with a few stabs. It's a bit like the, the guitar is another drum at times, rather than trying to be heroic. That, that didn't always work with Genesis. You had to be subtle after the ordeal now that's yours uh was that written on the spot that was that based on some ideas you had coming in well 
originally I was thinking of it as an electric guitar instrumental, but that never really quite worked out. The, the melody didn't, didn't really swing like that. And it wasn't until I played it on nylon guitar with Tony playing a florid keyboard accompaniment on piano that the thing started to gel. So with those additional parts, suddenly it started to make sense. And the second part is kicked off by, it's a melody by Mike Rutherford. And then I take it back to my melody at the end, which I live tend to improvise over. Uh, flexible length, depending on how I'm fitting on the mic. The cinema show, is the acoustic, or I don't know if that's nylon, is that is that mic? And is the electric you on, on that song? Yeah, it's, it's a number of guitars. Again, it's this early Genesis approach where you've got a number of things all chiming away. There's at least two 12 strings, and there's one 12 string yeah. recorded at half speed. So when you bring it up to regular speed, it's very high and tinkly, very chocolate box, very magical. I'm playing six string electric, but clean most of the time throughout the song, except when I'm doing some lead phrases. And um, I played them very quietly, almost like another woodwind instrument. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want it, it to be a bull in a, in a china shop. You know, I was thinking of my friend Ian McDonald's phrases, uh, his flute phrases on I, I Talk to the Wind and that kind of stuff where it would be very melodic. So I wanted to function like another another melodic instrument, but to be able to swim in and out of the picture. And of course, the big bit in the tune is once it hits the keyboard solo towards the end and you get the big voices coming in the choir so that it really does go cinema scope at that point. And I think that it's another song that sounds all the sweeter with the passing of time because somehow there's something very nostalgic about the... Uh, about the lyric and uh, and I, 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 every time I play it live, it touches me. So I, 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 can, I can feel that echo. With Isles of Plenty, is Proggers love to have the reprise. Sure, yes, of course, yeah. It was merely an idea of bookending the album with something. Uh, but I think that the segue is very clever because you come from a big orchestral stroke keyboard moment into something that segues with the, the original riff, with the original chorus from from the first song. So in a way, it's returning to the same place, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily knowing it for the first time, but I love the way that that dovetails and it makes you feel that the journey has returned to your starting point in slightly altered form because it comes in with nylon guitar on the record. And when we do it live, I very much enjoy it. We do our own version of it now, you know, with my guys. And um, I, I wouldn't dream of asking my team to do it exactly the same. There wouldn't be any point. There's too mm -hmm. many multiples of of Pete Gabriel doing uh, versions of things he would have heard in um, British supermarkets, you know, with um, those kind of things that are on offer and they're spoken and all of that. You know, it's almost as if my band gets a almost kind of slight reggae feel with it, but it's all very restrained. And, and I think within within the spirit of early Genesis, there's, no, there's nothing crass here about it. I don't think anything overstates its welcome. And of course, it comes at, at, the, at the end of this big, long seven, eight, workout for, for keyboards, bass, drums, uh, and um, we add bass. I, I use, I might used to do it with, with 12 string, but I, I do it with, with a six string. I've got a doubling octave, so the technology allows me to do that. So I can I can kind of be him and, and switch between what's me and what's him. And Hope you enjoyed that. We have four different series of us talking to Steve Hackett on our sister channel, Rock History Music. That's our big channel. We've almost reached 60,000 subscribers. On this one, Rock History Book, we usually go through celebrations of birthdays, which we're starting next week, top tens, reviewing classic albums, where are they now, that kind of thing. And of course, track by track. I want to thank Steve Hackett for being our special guest and being such a good sport on talking about every single track on Selling England by the Pound. Man, I love that album. Make sure you comment on our videos, subscribe to our channel, and share our videos, and buy a Rock History Book t-shirt. We also have Rock History Music t-shirts and Rock History Canada t-shirts. All logos professionally done, and you can choose the quality of your t-shirt. You want to buy a bargain basement version of our t-shirts? You can. You want to buy like a premium t-shirt? You can do that as well. A link is in the description of this video at the very top. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Book. Take good care of yourself.